here are some exciting coming attractions from Paramount. If there are no UFOs, if ghosts really don't exist, if angels are only a myth, then how do you explain the traces? How do you explain the sounds? And most of all, how do you explain the sightings? Beyond imagination lies the truth. Now you can take home three specially compiled editions of sightings available only on home video. The UFO Report, The Goat Report, and The Psychic Experience are just $14.95 each from Paramount Home Video. Now available on video cassette. Sirius 4, you are cleared for deorbit. Copy traffic control. Sirius 4, ready for pre-ignition. Prepare for a journey to the outer limits of human understanding. Travel at the speed of imagination itself. Venture into realms of unimagined vastness, cosmic mystery, and stunatural beauty. Guided by your host, Patrick Stewart. Come with us, then. All aboard the spacecraft of the imagination. It's time to embark on a journey from here to infinity, the ultimate voyage. From your starting to the space station orbiting the Earth, you'll engage engines and accelerate into the adventure of a lifetime. Your trajectory will take you through the solar system to the nearest stars, to the edge of the Milky Way. Plunging into the swirling vortex of a massive black hole, you will make your way to the very edge of the universe and beyond. Powered by a stunning digital stereo soundtrack, From Here to Infinity is a uniquely produced tour of the wonders of space for adventure lovers of all ages. All brought to life by Patrick Stewart. From Here to Infinity, the ultimate voyage. Priced at only $14.95. On video now from Paramount Home Video. Now available on video cassette. And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. On this special home video edition of Sightings. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Are you seeing this thing zip back and forth? They're out there, and sightings are on the rise. Just like it was sliding through the sky, and it tilted like it was looking down at us. It was a bright light that dimmed down to a white speck. Ordinary people, astronauts, cosmonauts, even former presidents have all seen extraordinary craft doing extraordinary things. I happened to glance out one time and there against the black sky was a, was a white object at about a 45 degree angle. From the historic crash in Roswell, New Mexico, to unprecedented mass sightings going on right now in the skies over Mexico City, the evidence is mounting. We are not alone. My Uncle Ted was standing more over here, kind of leaned over like this, and we're talking to this creature. Are certain people being targeted for terrifying encounters with alien civilizations? Are rumors of bizarre cross-breeding experiments true? I remember being on a table with my head turned away, not wanting to look at this creature. Does the government know more than they're willing to tell us? Our government has flat out lied to us for 40 years or more. Terror, wonder, conspiracy, transformation, they're all part of the UFO experience. Hello, I'm Tim White. Are UFOs real? You'll find out in this special report from Sightings.
In the vast expanse of space lie wonders unimaginable. Galaxies yet to be discovered, planets unnamed and unexplored, exploded stars teeming with the building blocks of life. Scientists are devising new technology to reach these outer worlds, but perhaps someone or something out there has beaten us to it. It was just a red flash of light. It, it sounded like a, well, a swishing sound, sort of. Et alors autour de cette forme, il y avait des petites lucioles rouges. I saw this big triangular shaped three lights on each corner coming over my house. Mysterious lights in the sky. They were like stars. No sound. Uh, it just like was sliding through the sky and it mm -hmm. tilted like it was looking down at us. And it was a bright light that dimmed down to a white speck and went back to a red light, down to a white speck and then just disappeared. You guys watching this inside? It's going out. Going straight out. Are these people sighting extraterrestrial spacecraft? Or is their imagination fueled by movies, books, and television simply misidentifying experimental aircraft? Holy cow! To answer these questions, we have to look back at the history of UFO sightings. Cave art in Australia and the western United States, painted at least 5,000 years ago by prehistoric civilizations, seems to resemble modern descriptions of creatures from outer space. Halfway around the world, a 13th century fresco inside a church in Yugoslavia includes a flying vehicle. It would be another 700 years before technology made flight possible. The modern age of UFOs began in 1947. Ex-military pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying his plane over the Cascade mountain range. He encountered several objects traveling at an extreme rate of speed. Although there are no photographs, Arnold had a drawing made of what he saw. His sighting triggered hundreds more that year across the United States. UFO mania reached a fever pitch in the summer of that year when the Army Air Force reported recovering a crashed saucer in New Mexico. The next day, the government claimed the disc was only the wreckage of a weather balloon. Sightings of unexplained phenomena weren't limited to just the United States. Marina Popovich, a Soviet pilot with over 100 air speed and endurance records to her credit, had her first UFO encounter in the mountains of southern Russia. My first contact with a UFO was a rather special experience. It was in the mountains, and I saw a sharp ray coming out of a huge sparkling ball. Even some of the men and women who have been in space have reported seeing things they can't explain. Gemini and Apollo astronaut James McDivitt had his own encounter in June of 1966. While in orbit above the Earth, an unidentified object outside the window caught his attention. I happened to glance out one time and there against the black sky was a, was a white object. Uh, geometry of it was sort of like a, a beer can or a Coke can with a, with a pencil sticking out the, one of the round edges at about a 45 degree angle. What was it? McDivitt did snap a few pictures, but after turning the film over to NASA, the film mysteriously disappeared. Was it a clerical error or evidence of a government conspiracy to hide the truth about what's really out there? A 1990 Gallup poll showed that nearly 50% of Americans believe in the existence of UFOs. This despite the fact that most photographs and film footage of the actual sightings are not very good. The images are scratched, out of focus, or the camera's just too far away to see things clearly. But with the advent of the home video camera, more and more people have captured unexplained phenomena on tape. This home video was shot over Las Vegas in early 1991. It shows three objects floating and diving in front of the mountains. This is a spectacular maneuver. As you say, it goes in front of the mountains and it has the mountains as a backdrop, which gives you a fairly good idea of its distance. July 2nd, 1947, Roswell, New Mexico, the time and place of the most significant event in UFO history. Something crashed on a remote sheep ranch and was confiscated by the military. But what crashed remains a mystery, fiercely debated for more than 50 years. Roswell, New Mexico. It's as quiet and peaceful today as it has been for decades. But on July 6th, 1947, that tranquility was shattered by a local newspaper headline. Air Force captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. The story described wreckage of a flying disc 
found near a place called Corona, and it was based on a press release written by the public information officer at Roswell Air Base, Lieutenant Walter Hout. This building here, uh, building number 84, is a building, I believe, that they brought materials from the Corona crash and stored them in here temporarily. The chief intelligence officer at the base, Major Jesse Marcel Sr., was sent out to the ranch to collect the crash debris and transport it to the Army Air Force headquarters for examination. In the meantime, newspapers all over the western United States picked up the story. But before Marcel had landed his plane and strange cargo, the Air Force issued a second bulletin. By the time the B-29 with Jesse Marcel and some of the wreckage got to the headquarters two hours after they left in Fort Worth, Texas, the fix was already in to kill the story. The second press release was far different from the first, saying the wreckage was actually from a weather balloon. Could the Army's top intelligence investigators have committed such a basic blunder, failing to recognize the mundane remains of a weather balloon when they first encountered it? No, says nuclear physicist and part-time UFO researcher Stanton Friedman, who's been investigating the Roswell crash for over a decade. He says that while Marcel was in the air, the Roswell base commander, Brigadier General Roger Rainey, got orders from Washington to cover up the incident. And what he did? was arranged for the wreckage of a weather balloon, the radar reflector on a weather balloon. And for a while, the saucer saga was forgotten, and might have remained so if Major Marcel hadn't rekindled the fire in 1980. Just before he died, Marcel admitted that the weather balloon story had been fabricated to hide the truth. He told Walter Hott there really was a saucer crash. He made statements to the effect that it was nothing of this world. It couldn't be bent, torn, cut, uh, pierced, <laughs> burned. Uh, he went through a whole list of them. He said, we just don't have the technology to produce material like I brought in from that ranch. Stanton Friedman contends that wreckage from an unidentified craft landed 200 miles away from the Roswell site. Friedman and other ufologists believe that this proves that there was not one but two crashes over New Mexico on July 2nd, the result of a spectacular mid-air collision and at the second site there were survivors. When I first came up to the, the craft, the creatures were laying like this in a line, side by side. And the live one was, was over here. Gerald Anderson says he was five years old when he and his family came across the unearthly wreckage and bodies. And my dad was kind of oh, right about here, and he was sitting like this. My Uncle Ted was standing more over here, kind of leaned over like this, and they were talking to this creature. Anderson's story matches that of others who were in the area at the time. With the help of hypnotherapy, he's been able to remember the encounter with startling detail. His description matches those from people who claim to have seen aliens. Four feet tall, grayish skin, large eyes, long skinny arms and fingers. Anderson recalls two aliens were dead, a third dying, and a fourth alien survivor seemed to be trying to communicate. Then just suddenly he turned and he looked at me. And when that happened, all kinds of things just started happening inside my head. I, I, I started getting sensations of tumbling and falling and an awful loneliness, like there was no way he could possibly get back to where he came from. Anderson says that within a matter of minutes, the military arrived, sealing off the area. The civilians at the site were threatened with bodily harm if they talked. Nevertheless, in the past 20 years, hundreds of witnesses have come forward, some daring to speak only on their deathbeds. Since Roswell ushered in the modern age of ufology, there have been more than 200,000 UFO sightings. Most are single craft witnessed by a single individual, making it virtually impossible for researchers to verify. But since 1991, ufologists have been documenting the largest mass sighting in history in the skies over Mexico City. The sightings began on July 11, 1991. On that day, there was a total eclipse of the sun. One of the best places in the world to view the eclipse was Mexico City. And for the first time, because of the home video revolution, thousands of people pointed their video cameras to the skies. Exactly at the time of the full solar eclipse, a disc-shaped craft appears over the city, hovers for over 30 minutes. 
17 people on the ground, recorded it on home video. And that's never happened before in the history of ufology. When modern scientists tested the date of the historic solar eclipse, they weren't alone. Some believe the ancient Mayas also predicted the exact date of the eclipse more than 3,000 years ago. This Maya calendar made another startling revelation. It predicted that on the day of the eclipse, a new age of enlightenment would begin. It's referred to as the prophecy of the sixth sun. The legend of the sixth sun, the new sun, signified by the great eclipse that just occurred, speaks of an opening of knowledge. The sixth sun indicates precisely the moment of its arrival. Strangely, on the day of the eclipse, something did arrive in the skies over Mexico. Hundreds of those home video cameras that were shooting the eclipse got something completely unexpected. UFOs, unidentified flying objects, all videotaped by hundreds of different people. So far, more than 110 home videos have been verified as containing footage of unexplained craft. It may sound difficult to believe in a city with almost 20 million people that practically every afternoon you can see a UFO. Jaime Masson is one of the most respected television journalists in Mexico City today, in the Mexican version of 60 Minutes. Masson calls himself a former skeptic. During the last year, thousands, and I would say hundreds of thousands of people, have witnessed UFOs. What I feel is important as an investigative reporter is the fact that the evidence presented was never questioned. The credibility of the witnesses was attacked, not the proof that they presented. People from all walks of life videotaped wave after wave of UFOs hovering in the sky. Sightings has obtained the exclusive U.S. rights to these historic tapes. One of the first to come forward with his home video was respected dentist Dr. Marco Antonio Rosas. The people are definitely not nervous or afraid of the appearances of the UFOs. The people actually like the idea and feel that these appearances can bring some benefit to the Earth. Since the eclipse, the UFO sightings have continued week in and week out and the acceptance of the phenomena by government officials has made even the most reticent eyewitnesses willing to come forward. Padre Ferrer, a priest at a local Catholic church, has seen and recorded these mysterious UFOs. Christ speaks of um, his kingdom as not being from this world, that his angels would help him. But these writings are very dangerous and I don't like to use them. But I believe that there is a possibility. I believe there are a lot of possibilities. I came out to take a video of that pine tree against the light. When I came up, I saw the light appear over the mountain over there. It was not an ordinary light. It was uh, blue and very intense. I never been afraid of something like this. On the contrary, what I've been able to observe has been wonderful. Once a philosopher said, if God is outside of the truth, I'll stay with the truth. So I feel there is no contradiction. Unlike the US, where UFO controversy most often takes place outside the media mainstream, the Mexico mass sightings are discussed openly on national television. Not everyone agrees the UFOs are extraterrestrial craft. But in Mexico, healthy debate on the true origin of these UFOs is encouraged. So, to rule out the possibility that these UFOs are conventional aircraft or an organized hoax, we had our videotape footage analyzed by David Froning, retired chief scientist at a major aerospace firm. As far as the pictures of in-flight videos, it's about as good as I've seen. They demonstrate a, a field propulsion and technology that's far beyond anything that I'm aware of that we have today. Most scientists look at these things as not that these are phenomena that, that violate uh, known physical laws, it's just that they're phenomena that our, our known laws cannot explain right now. If these craft do defy the laws of physics as we know them, could they be alien spacecraft? Do they pretend a visitation from an enlightened civilization, as some believe? 
The sightings continue to this day, and there is a growing grassroots movement working in Mexico to find out what, or who, is patrolling their skies. UFO experts who conduct serious research have a whole vocabulary to describe their formative science. One term you may not be familiar with is flap. A flap occurs when UFOs appear in waves over a specific area, as in Mexico City. The appearance of a flap has sinister overtones for ufologists. All around the globe, there are certain places that seem to act as natural UFO magnets. These areas are attracting flaps, or waves of UFOs, that may last for years. There are hot spots in Russia, Europe, and in South America, the heavily populated city of Sao Paulo has had hundreds of sightings by thousands of people. These flaps have prompted researchers to try to find a common pattern or motive. Anybody who studies this soon becomes almost desperate to understand a pattern or to f impose some purpose on the phenomenon. In the United States, sightings are widespread and occur almost nightly. America's number one spot is Gulf Breeze, Florida. Ralph Fuller's sighting in 1988 was among thousands of others, but Ralph was the first to capture a UFO on tape. I don't know what that is out there over the Gulf, but we just, just had a uh, real bright light. I think it might be a flying saucer. They seem to spawn one another. The, the, the two went to three and four, and uh, ultimately, uh, over a matter of maybe a couple of minutes' time, uh, there were ten of these uh, lights out over the Gulf. And uh, they seem to be in some semblance of a formation, but still in all, there was no movement whatsoever, no noise, no sound, nothing of that sort. You see nothing but the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the nearest point of land would be the Yucatan Peninsula. And there were no boats or anything of that uh, type in the area either. These are sky watchers, amateur UFO enthusiasts in the Gulf Breeze area who go out almost every night of the week with cameras and binoculars in search of UFOs. What makes a good sky watching area for one is a good field of view, that is uh, being able to have an unobstructed view of the skyline and, and ideally you'd like to be away from city lights but that's not always possible. So we go out in the evening uh, and take our chances and you may have a relaxing evening uh, out under the stars and, and then you may be blessed with uh, a sighting, we just never know. We've seen uh, the amber-colored lights, eight lights in a perfect circle gliding and, and performing maneuvers in the sky. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, rows of lights uh, suggesting lights uh, perhaps around uh, the periphery of a craft. There are UFO hotspots all over the country. Gulf Breeze, certainly, but also here in New York State, near a little town called Pine Bush. And the hot spots here, near Pine Bush, according to one scientist, have a very special meaning. Bruce Cornett is a geologist who lives near Pine Bush, New York. After numerous significant sightings of UFOs near his home, he began studying the area with an electromagnetometer. What I found is that these magnetic anomalies are in specific patterns and all of the UFO activity, the landings, the sightings where they are taking off and landing when we've been able to uh, identify specific areas are associated with these magnetic anomalies. Are you suggesting that uh, nature created homing devices deep in the ground? No, I think that it's a reverse. If we are dealing with an alien uh, culture and they are doing something underground, they're using the natural magnetic anomalies to disguise their own magnetic signals. Are you saying there are, or could be, aliens in the Earth? I'm not saying it's certain. It is definitely possible, based on what I've seen. Do you realize how that sounds? I don't like the idea, just simply because it is so outrageous. Then I would have to also add some of the photographic data that I have that shows, at least in one particular case, a UFO going up at a seven-degree dive right down into the ground, what appears to be. 
One of the most well-documented sightings in history occurred in Pine Bush on August 6, 1992. We think in excess of a thousand people may have seen two, three ships or four ships where I took video and all the police departments across the whole uh, lower New York State area were simply inundated with just hundreds and hundreds of calls. We looked over top of the trees and it was this object there out of nowhere, this great big object. It was about 300 foot wide, the size of a football field hanging over your head and about 300 foot off the ground. We looked at our clocks and we had three battery running clocks, two in the kitchen and one in the living room. And for some strange reason, all three clocks were stopped at the same time. Just about everyone in Pine Bush has seen a UFO. In his barber shop, Butch Hunt hears a lot of stories from eyewitnesses about strange alien encounters. Well, about 60% of the people around here, I, I think, have seen something. And some talk about it and some don't. They're just afraid to talk about it, afraid of ridicule and intimidation. The one that we saw was over a Red Mills Bridge, and there were six of us in the car, but it just so, so nice, it just glided right over the trees, and we just got out and stood there, and just gawked at it, and nobody said a word. But the whole episode was probably 30 seconds. But it was huge, it was bigger than the bridge. UFOs are sighted by all kinds of people, including uh, the most credible professionals that you can find. In addition, when we have multiple witnesses we can, who all tell the same story, uh, then we can say, well, that's probably a pretty good report. If we have enough detail in a given report that we can rule out all of the uh, normal explanations, it's not the planet Venus, it's not the Aurora Borealis or a meteor, it's not an aircraft that we can name, uh, then we are talking something very incredible. If these mysterious craft are being piloted by an alien civilization, what is their mission? Why Earth? And why now? There are growing numbers of people, now in the thousands, who believe that they've been abducted, manipulated, and then released by aliens. It sounds ridiculous until you hear their stories. I looked up in my rearview mirror and lights were coming down out of the sky. I walked out to the edge of the water and I noticed this huge shining thing. I was so terrified looking into these big black eyes and these little creatures. I was thinking I could just raise my fist and crush his head. And exactly at that moment I became paralyzed. The visions often come during sleep. Nightmares about being abducted, probed, and prodded by aliens who have sinister motives. Hundreds of people have come forward to talk about their disturbing experiences and admit that they think their nightmares are real. Experts believe that there are thousands, perhaps even millions more just like them, who are too afraid to talk. We have hundreds and thousands of people who are coming forward and saying that the abduction phenomenon has happened to them, that they've experienced it, and basically they say the same thing as everybody else has said, and until recently, there was no possibility that they could have picked up these stories in the media. Since she was a baby, commercial photographer Kim Carlsberg has been plagued by memories of abduction. At 4.30 in the morning, I saw this image of these four beings just move through this wall. They just, like it wasn't there. And they came over to me, two at my feet, two at my head, and they started to lift me up to the ceiling. Bud Hopkins has been researching alien abduction reports for 26 years and is a firm believer. I'm the first to admit that all this sounds outrageous. It all sounds just crazy, and yet the evidence is there behind it. These particular problems could adequately be explained by the condition narcolepsy. This is a disorder characterized by hypnagogic hallucinations and hallucinations that occur at sleep onset, which can be very vivid um, and uh, uh, include the feeling of other people being present in the room or a sensation of levitation. Patients will actually describe saying that they are looking down onto their body. I have two people that I've never met describing this exact same examination of their head being opened up, something being done to their brain, and being put back together again. They opened my back. I knew my back was open because I could feel. It was almost as though a slit had been drawn down my back and across to the side and they had opened a flap of 
of flesh and, and tissue. Whether the reports come from adults or children, men or women, most of them follow similar patterns. There's a bright light that shines in the room. The abductee sees it. They hear a noise outside. They're not interested in your maid. They're interested in you. So what they do is they render the person that you're with unconscious. She goes up a beam of light with the alien into a hovering craft. If anyone well, goes into the room at that point, there's no one in the room. She's not in bed, in other words. Uh, the person is literally missing. You find yourself on a table and uh, these creatures around you with instruments and you have no idea what they're doing and, and they don't tell you. The focus of the entire enterprise seems to me to be unmistakably on reproductive issues. 90% of reported abductions involve descriptions of what experts call gray aliens, extraterrestrial creatures with oversized heads and dark almond-shaped protruding eyes. Less common are insect-like or reptilian creatures. The reptilian type has bothered a lot of people. It seems to be quite hostile and intrusive, it often has claw-like hands, and I know there's one case where claw marks were photographed on the back of a woman. There's one being in particular that I always recognize, and he's not a gray. He's taller, he's thinner, he's got a bigger head, he's got bigger eyes. His limbs are very praying mantis-like. I remember being on the table with my head turned away, not wanting to look at this creature. And then when I looked at him, I just recognized him as the one that I hated. In a few cases, subjects claim to see hybrids, creatures who are half human, half alien. Some abductees believe they are being crossbred with aliens to create these hybrids. A very important part of the abduction phenomenon is that uh, there are reproductive procedures carried out upon them. I've been shown children, I've been shown babies, I've been asked to hold children and babies, I've been asked to give these children affection, and uh, these children aren't alien children and they're not human children, they're somewhere in between. I had a woman who had been to the doctor, had an ultrasound done. Her husband was there. Everyone observed at three months a healthy fetus. The next day she wakes up screaming, they took it. She's so upset, her husband takes her back to the doctor. He does a pregnancy test, finds out she's no longer pregnant. They do a DNC, there's nothing there. The most humiliating thing that happened to me is they put a cylindrical sort of thing over my genitals. And it made me have an orgasm in a second. And I really feel like I'm one of those few men who knows what a woman feels like if she, when she's raped. I've been on a table and I've seen something removed from my body that I will call a fetus, a baby. It was so small I couldn't believe that it could live on its own. I remember putting my finger in the arch of its foot. I was afraid to look at the face. I was afraid to see what it looked like. There seems to be an enormous interest in the emotional side of this, too, on the part of the aliens. They want us to hold these odd little children, these babies. They want to see how a mother will hold in love uh, a child, things which to us are instinctive. The abduction phenomenon begins usually in infancy, or at least by the age of two, three, or four. Uh, it continues all through uh, childhood, all through maturity, and into old age as well. I have many cases where the person is taken as a child, usually what we'd refer to as the bedroom visitation. I was laying in bed, I opened my eyes, and here's a little gray standing there looking at me. And all I could really remember were those dark eyes. That little person, as they, as he or she grows to adulthood, will be abducted over a period of time at irregular intervals. Let us assume that this is all being made up, that this is internally generated, that there is no abduction phenomenon. If that's the case, then we have discovered something of enormous importance. What are the repercussions of thousands of people running around thinking they're crazy, feeling crazy, being crazy, because they have no way to understand what's happening? Psychiatrists and psychologists who are dealing with these people are the first to say, something happened to this person. This is not a fantasy. This is not something the person cooked up. This was an event in that person's life which was truly, uh, truly upsetting. These experiences are not pleasant experiences. This is not something I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy happened to me. There's a part of me that would love to find the answer that it was something else. One of the most important and controversial UFO sightings in U.S. history occurred in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania in 1969. 
To this day, many researchers who've investigated this sighting believe it is a model for how our government maintains secrecy and disseminates disinformation about UFO sightings. Kecksburg used to be just like a lot of other small villages in western Pennsylvania. But in 1965, Kecksburg lost its anonymity when it became one of the world's most famous UFO landing sites. I happened to look up in the sky and I seen this red fireball. It, it sure wasn't a meteor, because I've seen them fall before. I've never seen any of them with blue lights on. And it looked like it made a, a turn and come back again. And when it come back, it seemed like it went down. It was December 9th, 1965, a night that many townspeople will never forget. I got my flashlight and I started down through the woods up to where it was at. There was no wings, there was uh, no tail section, there was no motors, there was no windows, there was no doors. It was big enough for a grown person to stand up in. It had like Egyptian writing, like backwards writing on it. Stars and circles and dashes and lines and things like that. It looked like uh, an acorn. It was really weird. Some claim the UFO wasn't the only thing to arrive that night. It wasn't too much longer. Uh, down through the woods come two gentlemen. The one gentleman very ramrod straight, very authoritative voice, crew cut hair. I mean, he just reeked of military. He looked at the object and looked at us. He says, all right, this is now a restricted area. Unions are all ordered out of here. Some military people come to the house and said they'd like to use the phone. They, they sort of took the house over. We started talking among ourselves what it, what's going on. About that time up here on the road, there comes a big flatbed truck in. The flatbed went down and empty, and it come back out with something on the back of it covered up about the size of a Volkswagen. That truck was hell bent for leather, and if you'd have walked out on that road, you'd have still been there, because they'd have scraped you up with a putty knife. They weren't stopping for anything or anybody. And that began the real mystery of this whole thing. 27 years later, what happened down there in that woods surrounded by fields, if anything happened down there at all, is still a matter of bitter controversy. You've got this town split into two groups. you got the believers and the non-believers. There's been some friendship lost, and, and it's, it's foolish as far as I'm concerned. I have a brother-in-law that uh, he hasn't spoke to me for two years and said that I lied about everything, but I never lied about a thing. you got neighbors and neighbors that has known each other all their life. Now they don't want to talk because one believes it and one don't believe it. Just as the town is divided, so too are experts who have researched what really happened in Kecksburg. Planetary expert Robert Young believes that some citizens may have perpetrated a hoax. He claims the UFO was merely a meteor known to have passed over Ontario and several northern states that evening. Virtually all of the accounts can be explained by people having looked toward and seeing the Ontario meteor. How about the accounts, though, of the military that turned out in large numbers kept people away from going down there, a truck that went down into the area and came out. You got eyewitnesses that say, this happened. Right. I, I understand. I've, uh, I have uh, written, signed eyewitness accounts from 61 local people who say that that did not, that there was nothing last year it was recovered, there was no military occupation. A lot of people and, probably think you're the government. Well, sure, yeah, but I'm not. I don't know how some people can say that nothing ever happened when there were so many people that saw things that night. Something had to happen. I know what I saw, and I'm not going to deny it. They can tell me I'm lying, but I know that I seen the military in my house that night. Freedom of Information Act states there was 212 military personnel here that night. Sightings attempted to speak with the Kecksburg residents who deny anything extraterrestrial ever happened here. But they all refused our invitation to talk. Even the landowner whose property was the alleged crash site remained silent. I think the government bought them off. Or threatened them with something that got them scared half to wits. Ironically, their refusal to talk has only deepened the controversy. UFO researcher Stan Gordon heard about the Kecksburg incident on the radio the night it allegedly happened in 1965. He's been investigating the sighting ever since. So much of what we know about the case now, we've learned since about 1987, with the fact that now we have at least four different eyewitnesses who apparently saw the object on the ground at Kecksburg. The fact that there are dozens of people, independent of each other, who don't even know each other yet, 
who have given us detailed information about what they experienced and saw that night. And they're giving us confirming information that has not been published yet. The skeptics, and these include the people who own the land and some very substantial citizens of Pittsburgh, think that this whole thing is loony. Mm -hmm. Why do they feel so strongly the other way? could be that some of these people were in the wrong place at that time. They were in a position where they didn't see what was going on. And if you see the geography of the area and where the majority of people were that night, they could not have seen the military activity that was happening on the land on the other side of the area down there. Do you have any hard evidence at all that what went down in the woods near Kecksburg was something other than a meteor or was anything at all? Unfortunately not. As in so many of these cases, you have to go by the eyewitness accounts. And in this case, the eyewitness accounts are very, very strong. And uh, again, unfortunately, we don't have that type of information. If this was the case, whether it be a space probe or in other UFO cases, sure, if we had the physical hardware, the mystery would be over. What do you think it is? What do I think it is? At this point, and again, this is not conclusive, at this point, the weight of evidence would point in the direction that this may have been a Soviet space probe. If the object were proven to be a Soviet space probe, then many questions would be answered. If a Soviet device landed in Kecksburg, the government would have been required by international treaty to recover and return immediately any space debris to the country of origin. But retired Army Sergeant Clifford Stone doesn't believe the Soviet probe theory. If this was of Soviet origin in 1965, the State Department would have released documentation to me under their moon dust files. To date, none of that information has been forth. Clifford Stone collects government documents about space debris recovery operations, like Project Moondust and Project Blue Fly. He began his investigations in 1965 when, as an Army sergeant, he witnessed a top secret delivery to Lockbourne Air Force Base, about 200 miles from Kecksburg. I noticed that on the back of the vehicle, it had something that was covered by a tarp. It was about uh, 10 to 12 foot at the base, 12 foot tall. It looked like a chocolate drop. When my friend told me that uh, every question I ever had about UFOs was under that canvas, I was mystified. Since that time, Stone has repeatedly attempted to obtain information from the government regarding that object. Each time, the government's response has been the same. They have taken the stance, by direction of the President of the United States, we may neither confirm nor deny the existence or non-existence of any information that all involve the recovery of unknowns. Kecksburg remains a town divided. The only thing on which believers and non-believers can agree is that all they want to know once and for all is what really happened on December 9th, 1965. What would you like to see happen next? It's time now after 27 years that the public has the right to know the true facts regardless of what the object was or what really occurred. Something came down from numerous eyewitness accounts to a, a lot of military activity into the small village. Then an object was located, that it was recovered, it was transported away for study. What was the object and why after 27 years haven't they revealed what really was found? Until authenticated debris is collected and publicly displayed, the validity of the UFO phenomenon rests entirely with the credibility of its eyewitnesses. Ufologists know this and have spent many years collecting sightings reports from the most credible eyewitnesses of all, military pilots. Unfortunately, these pilot reports remain unconfirmed because military personnel in this country refuse to talk on the record. But in Russia, one former Soviet pilot is talking. In 1991, a pilot in Russia came forward and told of a frightening UFO encounter. Risking ridicule, Maxim Cherbakov was determined to tell what he maintains is the true story of his bizarre experience. At 19, Cherbakov was one of the rising stars in the Soviet Military Flight Academy and became the Russian equivalent of a top gun. His flying record was impeccable until August 1991. Then, on two separate occasions, he had strange mechanical malfunctions in his jet aircraft. On one occasion, he was forced to eject. An investigation of that incident concluded that Cherbakov had acted calmly and rationally. But 12 days later, a third incident would change Cherbakov's life forever. Was so small, August. 20th August, second shift. I made two flights with my commander, and third flight I made on my own. I gained an altitude of 3,900 meters. 
Then suddenly, I saw a ball in front of me, about 20 degrees to the right. He watched the object for several seconds. Then, as it came toward him, Cherbakov tried to radio the base. The light from the UFO was blinding. A sense of unexplainable fear came over me. On the back of my head, I began experiencing warmth. I felt as if someone was present and watching me. My movements were under control, controlled by someone other than me. Cherbakov claims the reddish-yellow object started maneuvering around the aircraft. For several minutes, it kept up with the jet's airspeed and mimicked its movements. During that time, Cherbakov was unable to communicate with his base commander. The radio emitted only a squealing sound. Pilot Cherbakov's description of the UFO moving relative to his own airplane is really quite common. Dr. Richard Haynes has documented over 3,000 pilot sightings of UFOs. I have thousands and thousands of cases of pilots in daylight encounters with structured objects in the sense of having three-dimensional mass, in the sense of having aerodynamic kinds of, of uh, uh, flight behavior relative to the aircraft. And so what he describes here fits in very nicely to what I have from hundreds of other pilots around the world. Suddenly, in rapid-fire succession, the generator in Cherbakov's jet failed. The instruments indicated a fire on board, and the cockpit filled with smoke. The base commander ordered Cherbakov to eject. I began arguing with the commander because the plane was still above the residential area. My altitude began to drop rapidly. I had to pull the plane out of a nose dive. At the altitude of 1,000 meters, I finally cleared the residential area and I ejected. Four seconds later, the plane exploded. Cherbakov landed safely in a field and was rescued an hour later by a military helicopter. While officials combed the wreckage of the jet, Cherbakov was examined at a military hospital. An intensive three-day interrogation followed. The interrogation was conducted with a sense of total distrust toward me. Right from the start, they told me that the first, the second, and now the third incident is all your own doing. Cherbakov was also interrogated by the KGB, who did not believe his story and charged him with insubordination and sabotage under the International Terrorism Act. Cherbakov claims the KGB threatened that if he did not tell the truth, he would be brought to trial, found guilty of terrorism, and shot by a firing squad. Vladimir Azhaja heads the Russian Center for the Study of UFOs, housed in the Ministry of the Interior in Moscow. Dr. Azhaja is considered one of the world's foremost experts on UFO phenomena and has studied Cherbakov's case. We concluded that Maxim has a normal, healthy psyche and is not inclined to fantasies. Retired Major General Albert Stubblebein is a former commanding general of U.S. Army Intelligence. He witnessed and documented a hypnosis session conducted with Cherbakov by an American psychiatrist. As she was taking him into the trance, he changed from this terrorized, fear-ridden kid into a pilot, sitting in the cockpit, sitting in the seat, sitting with the controls, relating what was going on. There was a change in the individual. Anybody can fabricate. The question is, was he fabricating? And he struck me as a person who, in that situation, was not fabricating. Whatever it was that he was saying, he truly believed had happened to him. Maxime really believed he had not done anything wrong, in fact, had done the right thing, um, and desperately wanted this sorted out. Although affidavits to that effect were presented at his court-martial hearing, the court still blamed Cherbakov for the destruction of his aircraft. But the military prosecutor admits that some of the evidence of Cherbakov's innocence was very convincing. From the beginning, I had doubts about the truthfulness of Cherbakov's statement. But after questioning his mother, his comrades, and his superiors, I became convinced that Cherbakov had an encounter with a UFO. In January 1992, the case against Maxim Cherbakov was dropped. But despite this vindication, he was not welcomed back into the military. There is no training for pilots to deal with such encounters. The older pilots told me that a lot of encounters happen, but they don't speak about them. 
I feel that I'm missing something from my soul that I want very much. My love for the planes and flying has remained and will continue to remain. Did Maxine Cherbakov see a UFO? We may never know the answer, but one thing is clear. Maxim Cherbakov ejected only after he saw that his jet would avoid populated areas below. Many in Russia suggested that Cherbakov should be awarded a medal for heroism. The United States Air Force admits that between 1952 and 1969 they conducted a study codenamed Project Blue Book. Its purpose was to determine if UFOs posed a real threat to the American people. Project Blue Book concluded they did not, and since 1969, the Pentagon has denied participating in any other UFO study. But ufologists believe this is a lie. They point to evidence of a monumental conspiracy designed to hide what the government knows and when it knew it. Our government has flat out lied to us for 40 years or more. They've threatened people and intimidated people. They've spied on UFO groups, infiltrated UFO groups, spied on researchers, compiled dossiers. Their response is bordered on paranoia. In 1988, reporter George Knapp of Las Vegas CBS television station KLAS began investigating the U.S. government's involvement with UFOs. He says he's found evidence proving a massive cover-up that began in 1947 and continues to this day. The CIA says that it does not collect information on UFOs, and it hasn't since the 50s. There are reams of documents squeezed out of the CIA that indicate that they have on staff CIA UFO experts, agency personnel monitoring the situation on an ongoing basis. The FBI denied having any documents on UFOs in the 1970s, the early 1970s. Three years later, they released 1,700 pages of information on UFOs, documents that they had. They lie. But for UFO researchers, there is one persistent problem with those hundreds of released pages. Most, like this 1958 UFO memo to President Eisenhower, have been highly censored, essentially making them unreadable. Even this National Security Agency document explaining why UFO data should remain secret is itself almost entirely blacked out. Ironically, the official position of the U.S. government is that UFOs are not a threat to national security. Yet the agencies involved claim the censored information is vital to national security. From 1947 to 1969, the Air Force conducted Project Blue Book. Staffed with just three people, it studied 12,000 UFO sightings. All but 701 were explained to the military satisfaction. And the group that remained unexplained? It does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. The Air Force closed Blue Book in 1969, but project critics weren't satisfied. The first person to head it up, Captain Edward J. Repelt, quit in disgust, wrote his own book and declared that there was something to UFOs, and the Project Blue Book was nothing more than a whitewash. Other government officials, including the senator and two former presidents, have tried unsuccessfully to shed some light on the UFO phenomenon. Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater, President Gerald Ford, and President Jimmy Carter, who actually saw a UFO himself and filed a formal report, have all sought to have top-secret UFO information released to the public. All requests for that information were denied. Cover-up allegations aren't limited to the United States government either. Author Timothy Good claims that governments around the world are keeping UFO information top secret. And in his book, Above Top Secret, he claims only an elite few have access to that information. Because so little of the research is made known to top ministers. One country is bucking that trend. Belgium has acknowledged tracking unidentified, seemingly intelligently controlled craft in its airspace. Radar tapes released by the Air Force show an object jumping from 200 meters to 2,000 meters in one second, a distance of just over a mile. The Belgium Air Force has even put aside a plane to search for the objects. But the attitude of the United States remains very different. UFO experts claim our government is conducting top-secret research into UFOs in the middle of the Nevada desert. South of a dry lake bed known as Area 51 is a place known as S-4, 
allegedly home to a super-secret government research facility. In the course of our investigation, we found a scientist who says he used to work there. Robert Lazar was shocked when he first discovered what it was he would be working on. I got out of the bus, I was told to walk directly through the hangar, and uh, immediately, uh, even before entering the hangar, you can see the edge of a disc. Uh, this is your classic flying saucer, two inverted pie plates, if you wish, uh, with a segmented larger area dome on top. Within minutes of that, I finally realized that this had nothing to do with something the government was producing. And that was quite shocking because everything inside was small. This is a full-size craft, 30, 35 feet in diameter, maybe 40. Uh, but you're looking at, at uh, seats that are, you know, 18 inches off the ground, obviously made you know, for, for something smaller. It certainly wasn't made for children to play in. Lazar says there were nine spaceships in all, and he claims to have seen one fly. It began to lift off the ground almost silently. There was a hiss sound, uh, like a corona discharge, if you hear around high voltage systems, uh, accompanied by a faint, it probably would have been brighter at, at night, a faint uh, blue glow around the bottom as the craft approached about 30 feet, 20 feet, something like that off the ground, uh, that corona discharge disappeared. Uh, the sound stopped and the craft stood there silently and uh, slowly drifted over to the left and then to the right. The government denies they're testing alien craft at S-4. Lazar no longer works there and nowadays spends his time working on one of his hobbies, jet car racing. He alleges that after he went public, security officers at the base threatened his life. He also says that his employment and military service records have disappeared. Despite repeated requests, the government can't find them. The subcontractor who hired him for the job at S-4 refuses to comment. But a few clues support Lazar's contention that he is a scientist and that he has worked for the government. This W-2 form indicates that he had been employed by the Department of Naval Intelligence. Before his stint at S-4, Lazar claims to have worked at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Los Alamos officials can't find any record of him, but his name does appear in a laboratory phone book from that time. Reporter George Knapp was able to track down a few of Lazar's colleagues who could confirm parts of his story. But when they talked to Knapp, something strange happened. One after another had, had visits from, from government personnel who basically intimidated or told them to back off followed them around. There didn't have to be any direct communication where an agent says, you keep talking to this guy, you're going to end up in a river. The message was very clear. Since Lazar's story broke, Area 51 has become a hotbed for UFO sightings. You see that? It just zipped to the left. See it again? While our cameras were there, a bright light appeared in the night sky. Utterly silent, it seemed to float below the mountaintops. Analysis of our videotape proved inconclusive. Those who might know the answers aren't talking. I've been covering organized crime in Las Vegas for, for 10 years, dealing with uh, mob hitmen and mob informants, uh, people who have been in the witness protection program. The fear that is generated by this UFO subject for people who really know about it far outweighs the kind of fear that the mob inspires. I mean, people are more afraid of our government than they are of organized crime. I am exactly sure of what I saw. I know what mainstream science is like. I know what, where physics stands. I know all of that. And this is an extraterrestrial craft. This technology is hundreds and hundreds of years in advance of us. And that's the end of that story. The people we've heard from in this report believe that they have had close encounters of the first, second, third, even fourth kind. Skeptics charge that they're mistaken, that they're misinformed, or at the very worst, just plain crazy. But are we, the human race, so conceited as to believe that we are alone in the universe? Is it possible that in the infinite frontier of space, this speck of intelligent life we call Earth is the only one for sightings, I'm Tim White.